Hello and welcome to the new Spiro podcast where we interview experts, authorities and characters on all things spearfishing. Come and join us after the show at noobspiro.com, the online spearfishing community helping you to become a better Spiro. Here are your hosts for the show, Shrek and Turbo. G'day Noob Spiro community, today we have a manufacturer of high quality fins and spear guns based on the Gold Coast. Larry Gray is an avid Spiro who owns and operates penetrated fins. Welcome to the show, Larry. Hey guys, how you hey, going? Glad hey, to be here. Awesome, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's a, it's Friday night here, so big ups to you instead of having a beer and watching the footy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same here, mate. You kept me away from the telly. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so Larry, wh- where did you um, start spearfishing, and um, and what was that like? Uh, look, I, I've lived on the Gold Coast all my life. This is where I was born and, and grew up. I probably. The first I can remember with a spear in my hand, I think I was about nine years old. And uh, actually, I've got a, a clipping from a local paper, the bulletin of me and a mate with a hand spear um, shooting brim in the broadwater of all places, which certainly you can't spear now. But back then, it was it was um, was okay. So that that's sort of where it where it all started. And awesome. So some of the inshore water around the Gold Coast. Um... That's that's sheltered water, isn't it? It's kind of um... yeah. Oh yeah, all the board water is completely sheltered. Yeah, um, obviously all green zone now and no spearing allowed. So yeah. So so what when you when you started, you spent a bit of time in there in the dirty water shooting brim. What else did you target? Oh, the old black brim was a was a popular one, you know, like always for most guys starting out. Yep. Um, you know, if you come across a, a nice whiting or a flatty, you you were pretty happy. Yeah. Um, you know, my father was was heavily involved in spearfishing around the Sydney area in the 60s and um, sort of late 50s and early 60s, so the Ben Crop and Ron Taylor eras. All right. I grew up with uh, numerous stories of spearfishing and um, all the shark hunting and things that went on back in those days. So, um, you know, I'd go out a bit on my own as a kid and, and practice all the stories he told me and then uh, as we got a little bit older he uh he used to take us out and throw us in the water around cook island a, you know another place now that's um been designated as a green zone but it was a, a great place to dive back then yeah cool uh, that sounds like a great way to start so it's in the it's in your blood larry yeah definitely yeah i don't think there was any way i could ever avoid it and and you know nor would i want to I, I don't, probably like most of the guys that are into the sport now you know once your face hits the water and Especially if it's a good day, you you feel relaxed and all the other stresses of life seem to disappear and you concentrate on what you're doing. You know, it's a, it, it is it's, it's it's a lifestyle thing too. And I, I I do have a look at your Facebook page occasionally, and there's some great photos shared on there that really sort of capture that the spearfishing lifestyle and eating eating what you catch and things like that. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I'm fairly adamant about that um, that philosophy. I. Um, while I don't begrudge anyone for going out there and, and going after a trophy type fish, I think that's great to see too. But it's always good to know that the catch is eaten afterwards. And and personally, I'll always target fish that are, um, you know, better on the plate. Yep. And uh, <coughs> you say you so you've been diving the um, the Gold Coast area for quite a while. Have you noticed any changes in um, sort of fish populations or scarcity or anything like that over the years? You know, look, we haven't been able to dive inside the broadwater for quite a while. So the, the main, the really only haunts around the northern end of the coast where I live are uh, off the ends of the seaway walls, which, you know, a lot of the newer guys are uh, are diving because especially the southern wall, it's, it's very accessible. And I, I can remember when they first built the seaway there, I... Um, you know, after only about six months of it at operating, and I used to go up there, and I guess I was probably only about 16 or 17 at the time. You had to walk basically from SeaWorld all the way up there. Well, they had a bit of a dirt road going back then, but um, and there was reasonably good fish life there, you know, from the beginning. And uh, given the amount of pressure that's on it, it, it still seems to go really well, um, yeah. especially over the northern side. You have your bad days over there where it's quiet um but that's that's just fishing in general you know and spear fishing so i I really haven't seen a lot of change in that area some of the fish it depends on uh you know how hard they've been hit if we get a a run of good weather and good conditions and a lot of guys have been out uh the fish are a little bit harder to find but 
uh, in general at that end there. Um, I, I think the population and the sustainability aspect of it's it's very strong. Ah, oh, it's good to hear. On the on the Gold Coast for our for our audience, they're quite geographically spread. A lot of people probably aren't familiar with what the conditions are like around the Gold Coast. Could, what's the water temp like there? Visibility, seasonal variations, and things like that, Larry. Yeah, look, visibility at the moment we're we're coming into sort of May and um, halfway through May now, which is generally our best time of the year here. Um, the last few years has been tough, to be honest, on the coast. We've had last year was a good one. We had a good season on the mackerel, which are on now Spanish mackerel. Yep. Uh, good conditions and visibility. This year again, a couple of years prior to that, we had a lot of rain and, and poor vis, you know, times. And um, just lately, we've had a, a little bit of that as well. So it really depends what's happening weather-wise. Um, water temps this kind of time of year are great, you know, 23, 24 degrees, um, and should be for a little bit longer yet before they start to drop and. And that's when we'll see the fish and most of the pelagics and so forth start to drop off. There's been some good catches of wahoo getting taken off the tweed of late. Um, mackerel, from what I, well, I've experienced, a little bit quiet, but um, certainly they're around. Yeah, right. So you've been spearing for quite a while, Larry. Um, you must you must have shot a few good fish in your day. Do you want to share a um, particular memory? With us? Uh, look, I've shot some fish I'm fairly happy with. One in particular, I, I guess, because of the location, um, and, I, and I don't mind saying where it is, as I mentioned it earlier, a lot of guys go there. I was just on the southern wall of the seaway yeah, one wow. uh, one morning, just on my own, having a quick one, and hooked up with another local diver uh, that was there. I didn't know him at the time, but, you know, as you do, you just say good day and have a swim around together. And and he mentioned that he uh, I was sitting on the bottom throwing a bit of sand. That was a really nice, clean, good vis day, about 15-plus metres there, which is great for that area. Yeah. No swell. You know, no wind. And uh, he said, oh, I just see the snapper that come in behind you. And uh, no, no, I didn't really know him. You know, I thought, oh, maybe he's mistaken something else for a snapper. And I uh, yeah, took it with a grain of salt. So um, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll have a crack. You know, he might know what he's on about. So I burlied up and shot a, uh, a small um, grey mackerel that swam by and, and burlied it up. And sure enough, it was dropped on the bottom. It took me quite a few goes. You know, nothing happened. And probably about my second, I gave him a bit of a go and fair enough, he'd spotted it. And um, then he swam off a little bit and said, oh, I'll have one more go of the rest of it and dropped down and just waited. Sure enough, a big old snapper come in and had a bit of a go at the burly. And I had my, my old trusty 1.3 edge um, back then. This is going back a few years. Yeah. Uh, just managed to get a shot into it from a distance. They're a fairly tricky fish to get at the best of times. Mm, yeah. And, you know, in about, I think it was seven or eight metres of water and uh, and managed to land it and it come in at 6.8 kilos. So. Oh, wow. Nice that's an epic story, Larry. Well told. Yeah, mate, that's uh, one fish that I'm fairly happy with. And just well, not only because of the fish, the species, but where I got it, you know, it's on my, on my local where I've been diving since I was a teenager. Yeah, that's awesome, mate. You mentioned in there at one point you were lying on the bottom throwing up sand. Now, can you tell us why you would do that for the noob out there that's just starting out? Well, a lot of species of fish, you know, have a curiosity. It's uh, hunting fish is, from my experience, and, you know, I'm not uh, professing to be any um, great diver or hunter, but I, I certainly know a, a few guys that are, and, and I try to absorb as much as I can from them. But um, some species of fish are curious, um, mm -hmm. and you certainly rely on the curiosity of a fish to to get close enough to get a good shot into it's um, probably the, especially these days. I mean the the technology and guns and so and gear is has increased and the range has increased. But at the end of the day, if you learn those skills to get the fish into you, uh, you're going to certainly have a higher chance of of uh, catching a fish and, and landing a good shot that's going to hold the fish. Because you know at the end of the day, the last thing we want to do is wound something and yeah, and have it. Be and what um and what sort of species sort of in your area would you use that technique on? Um, look, you can do it. A lot of fish will come in for a look around the tweed area. The spangles or spangled emperor are very um uh, curious. Job fish will come in to have a look. Oh, yeah. Jobbies are pretty tough one, you know. They um <laughs> they're always very wary. Yep. I haven't been too successful on them. I can get them in, but they they uh, generally tend to outlast me on the breath hold side of things. but Yeah, um, they, they can be pricks of things, can't they? Like you're just sitting <laughs> there, it feels like you, you're getting contractions, you're only in shallow water and you're just coming, you little bugger, and they just never do. And so they're always hanging just out of gun range too. They're, they're, yeah. they're a canny fish. 
that's it. They're, they're pretty tricky. Yeah? And, you know, at those times, that's when your common sense and your, your judgment's got to come in and, uh, and don't push yourself too far because mm. sooner or later, you know, they'll come in close enough to get a good shot on one. you got a helicopter going over there, Larry. Yeah, can you hear that, can you? We're, we're not far from the hospital where we are, oh, so we quite often get... Sure. It's not a police yeah. helicopter, is it? <laughs> Maybe they heard you guys are on the line. Yeah. <laughs> hey, um, you, like Levi said, Larry, you have been spearing a while. What would be your scariest moment um, out spearfishing? What did you take away from it? Uh, my, my scariest moment, um, in all honesty, and probably different to a lot of people, I, I dive a bit with my son. He's... He's 17 now. He's been diving since he's 12. Um, mate, I, I love diving with him. He's, he's out of everyone I know. I'd, I'd rather go out with Brody. Um, we did a trip up the reef. Um, a friend of mine lives at Cairns, and uh, so we we flew up just for the weekend and and did a run out to the reef and just diving off his boat. We're all in the water. Brody and I were buddied up. Um, swam out to there was a ledge, average depth of about 10 meters, and a ledge dropped down to about 22, and it was holding a lot of trout. And uh, I was happy to sort of sit on it. It was a bit out of Brody's reach, but um, I was having a bit of fun on it. So I hoping he would stay there with me, which was what we'd sort of always discussed and I try and instill in him. Um, I come up from uh, a dive and couldn't see him. So it was a choppy day up there. Um, you don't get a lot of swell up there, but when the wind's up, you get a bit of chop and it's difficult to see see where your buddies are. We always dive floats and flags. So... And even in those conditions, I couldn't see his flag. Um, so I headed back towards the boat to try and find where he was, which at this stage was probably 60, 70 metres away and still couldn't find him. And and to be honest, at this stage, I was getting fairly worried. Yeah. Um, and I got, got up onto the boat to try and, you know, get a bit of height to see if I could spot him and actually found him and spotted him back in close right up against the reef. He'd you know, been a young fella. He'd headed back in where all the where it was a bit shallower and there was a few easier fish to shoot, which was fair enough. Got a bit impatient waiting for me on the deeper side. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Took off on me. and uh, But, mate, that was probably the scariest moment I've had. You're a long way out to sea up there when you're on the reef. And uh, to lose somebody, especially especially uh, one of my own, that far out to sea um, was quite scary. So. Yep, absolutely. And, and, it, and good... it's quite a common <laughs> story too, Larry, isn't it? Like I, I, I've, I've done it with my dive buddies too and, and – like they pop up a bit of swell or a bit of um, chop, and it's it's remarkable how fast those those flags disappear. But you're, you're, Isaac's like 130 kilos, and he's hard to lose. Like no matter what, it's like seeing like an island. The other day, a couple of birds came in and landed on his back. Just started pecking away. <laughs> a couple of pied oyster catches. That seal colony, is he? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Oh, I'm calling the walrus, mate. <laughs> I was 130 kilo. Oh, yeah. You Thanks were... to my elite diving diet, I'm down to 120. Oh, I'm a bit <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, and, that, and that, that's something I always try and install in any or reinforce with anyone. And and uh, it was done for me from a very young age as a safety expert to diving and it's so easy to swim away looking for a fish or, you know, you get bored waiting for your dive buddy to do something. Uh, and we're all guilty of it at times, but, yeah, it's something we all need to be vigilant of and, and stay together. So he got a bit of a talk and do after that and we <laughs> back together and he shot a few parrots in the shallow water and played with the little spangles that were in there. And, yeah, we had a good day. Ah, right. that sounds great. Excellent. All right, Larry, uh, now it's time for the uh, Veterans Vault. Take it away, Barnacle. Arr! It's time to open the Veterans Vault. So, Larry, uh, Veterans Vault is where we ask our special guest to share about a, an area of your ex expertise or, or, or passion to our audience. So today we've teed up to chat with you about carbon composites and perhaps a little bit about roller guns. Um, I guess we were talking about my my dainty figure before and being 120 kilos uh, something i wanted to ask you is um fins fin like w what sort of fin like a lot of guys say if you're a bigger bloke use harder fins what's your take on that yeah look at that that's a common um common reference and and to some extent it's true um depends on what makes you big if you if you're big um and fit for your size um, certainly you can push a harder fin, but if you like me... A lot of like KC me, makes him big, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> I've, no, I'm trying to put it nicely. If you like me, <laughs> um, you know, that's not necessarily the right way to go. I mean, I'm I'm 85 kilos and I'm probably 
eight kilos, seven or eight kilos too many on a, you know, what my <laughs> what my prime was, but I'm getting a bit older now, so I've got an excuse. Yeah. Um, and I use a soft carbon blade and and, and love them, you know. Yep. Um, you'll get more more benefit from learning a good finning technique and using a softer fin with a with a good responsive material like carbon fibre than you will from trying to push a heavy stiff fin around all day. Okay. Yeah, it's something I actually just started doing a free diving course, which is <laughs> I've lifted a bit long. I've done some courses and stuff in the past, but I haven't actually done my proper stage A. And um, yep. you know, lately there's been a lot of push to get everyone sort of up to skill. So I started training with a guy on the Gold Coast, Eamon Abdin, and I've just, I just did a pool session with him, and he was just hammering me on my poor finning technique because I've got I've got a dirty big pair of fiberglass fins that are hard as, mm. and um, yep. I'm, I'm bending my knees too much. And I, I know it's a common thing across spiros. We all, not much of us do have a good finning technique, um, apart from the guys that have perhaps paid attention to it. So, no, yeah, you, you're dead right. And, and that's what's coming out of um, the free divers sort of um, instilling some training techniques into spear fishermen is they're looking at the techniques and those finning techniques. If you look at guys, like, I'll tell you a good one to see and, if, and to watch from a spear fishing point of view, you can look at a lot of good free divers. They'll all have good finning techniques because they've been doing it for years. Mm. Um, and a good guy to watch, and if you can see it, is Ian Puckeridge. And there's a video floating around YouTube. You might have seen it of Aaron Puckeridge shooting a, I think it was a 10 odd kilo jobby wow. and claim in your world record for it. If, if, if your listeners want to go and have a look at that and watch Ian's there and he's fending off the sharks, keeping all the sharks off the jobby while Aaron's landing it. And just watch the finning technique on Ian. It's it's pretty well perfect. Yeah, okay. Right. Wow. Well, we've got a um, we've got Wayne Judge up here in Brisbane, and he, he's a um, a pretty good guy to teach finning technique as well. And but um, no matter how hard he tries, he I oh, still can't get it right. After all, everything, I'm still bending <laughs> those knees, mate. I don't know how soft fins can get. And and Turbo's got a set of your uh, your your fiberglass penetrator blades. Yeah, I can't kill him, but. Yeah, I think yeah. I, I think I might have to go a bit softer, like you said, Larry, uh, next time, because I've, I've got a set of legs on me like a um, an ibis, <laughs> so, <laughs> a sick ibis <laughs> with HIV, yeah. perhaps. <laughs> oh, thanks, bud. Use straws for leg warmers. <laughs> yeah. So, if if you were going to talk a bit more about carbon and and sort of the stuff you do with penetrator, Larry, what, what would it be? Uh, I'll probably, I, I guess. Um, give a bit of info on why the composite material is good for what we're doing with fins. Um, uh, there's a number of properties with it. Basically, it's, it's non-corrosive, so it's going to, you know, the, the environment we use it in is not going to hurt it, providing it's processed well. Mm. Uh, if there's any voids and so forth in the laminate, a composite, basically the, the, the definition of a composite is, a, is any two materials that are um, combined together where the, the end result um, gives a better property or a different property or either of those materials on their own. So it's a generic term. We use composite to describe our, or basically as a branding to describe our glass fibre fins. Okay. Um, so the composite in those is a glass fibre and an epoxy resin matrix, which glues all the fibres together. Providing those are processed well and you don't get any voids in there, you won't have any moisture ingress, which can damage those fibres. Okay. Um, and, and a good process, which, I mean, I've, my composite background probably spans over 20 to 25 years now when I think back, um, starting out in the sailing, um, competitive sailing side of thing, building um, anything from skiffs up to um, ocean-going yachts, you know, and masts and so forth with carbon fibre and, and uh, then relating some of those techniques into the dive gear through through my passion and interest in spear fishing. Um, and... Uh, you know, I think we're going to see it more and more. Spear guns, we're certainly starting to see carbon fibre come into the um, forefront of, of their development and engineering. Um, still a lot of hype out there surrounding it, and I think a lot of people don't fully understand uh, the benefits and the properties of composite. So, and I'm always happy to chat to people about it and, and try and explain it and, uh, I guess, decipher some of the myths that are out there and the marketing hype, which, which uh, people need to be a little bit careful of. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite a competed space too, isn't it, Larry? Like for such a small sport, oh, um, there's an amazing range of, of, of good quality gear out there. Um, what sort of like if, if if our audience are going to buy a set of fins, Larry? What are some of the defining 
characteristics that 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 a good fin has look a good fin is going to be easy to kick you don't want a set of fins that you're going to be struggling around so you don't want them too heavy that extra weight on your legs um is going to wear you out over a long day um good fin's going to be easy to kick and give you plenty of power um it's also going to be durable um certainly the composite fins aren't cheap so you don't want to be replacing them too often Mm. Uh, we haven't had a haven't had a failure with our uh, glass fiber range and the whole time we've been going which is a bit over or nearly six years now wow um so we're fairly happy with that carbon fiber um you you will have problems with it it's a little bit more fragile which is probably not a true a, a fitting description for carbon fiber um, fragile, but it's um, we use a lot less of it because yep. it's so much stiffer than the glass fiber. So the areas that can be prone to damage are the tips and things from kicking into rocks, or certainly if someone drops weight belts or eskies on them, they're going to fail. But um, yeah, that you know, look just manufacturer manufacturer quality. Make sure that you can you can get good backup service from the manufacturer if you. If you're buying something like that, that's a high-end product, um, yeah. and you know, and be able to speak to the people that make them. Yeah, it's good, mate. I've uh, I've got I've got a set of your your composite fins, and um, I went spearing with a bunch of fisher like fishers up north. And this one bloke, every time I put the fins on the deck, I don't know why, but he just had to stand on them. He had to fish on top of my fins oh. all day long, and yeah. I was just cringing. But after the three or four days of it. They weren't any worse for wear at That's all. That's why Spiros don't go out with line fishermen, Brown. They've <laughs> learned nothing, especially drinking line fishermen. Like they, they're only ever going to stand well, on I've, your gear. I've got, I've got some mates that are lionos, and we've been out doing the same thing and trying to spear and do that at the same time. The two just don't mix, No, nah. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> we don't play well. Yep. Hey, <laughs> No, that's it. We play well together. Yeah, hey, with... um. With your with your blades, Larry, what what foot pockets do you like, and what sort of um, what do you tell people to buy? I I, mean, I know a lot of it's relative to foot size and shape, um, but perhaps you could enlighten me. Well, what you said is right. Foot size and shape, and and pocket comfort is the number one factor we always try to um, try to highlight. The other area is functionality, and then and then comes durability again with the pocket. Again, you're spending good money, so you need something that's going to last you. And, and have a decent warranty. The most common pocket we sell is the Mara's Razor. Um, we find they fit most people really well. They certainly fit people with a wider foot. They have a um, you know a nice shape pocket. Um, they have nice flexible side rails, which allows the blade to bend, which is very important with a composite blade. It's no good spending a lot of money on a nice bendy composite blade and have the foot pocket restricted. Yep. Um, in saying that, people with narrow foot feet um the boche mundial is a good pocket um, the only downside and it's not really a downside for us because we've fitted heaps of them and we do it for no extra charges they have to be bonded or glued to the to the fin yeah um so it takes a little bit of um to skill to do that nicely so we prefer to get people just to send us their foot pockets and we'll fit them for no charge rather than sort of see them not fitted properly um those two you know why Wider foot, I'd stick with the Mara's Razor. Narrow foot, I'd stick with the Boche Mundial. Um, probably those two would be our most popular. Then a lot of guys, there's a bit of hype around the Pathos foot pockets, yep. which are, are very light. Unfortunately, they're very wide and can be quite low across the instep. So fit can be an issue for some people. Uh, and again, with the Pathos, they have to be glued on. So if you are going down that road and looking for, you know, ultra lightweight fins, um, the pathos will be good for that, but you do need to try them on and make sure that they're going to be comfortable, you know, for a long day's diving in the water. And, and how much does that matter when you just you're going to put a three mil dive sock on? Like, oh, look, it matters a fair bit. If, if it's still no matter how whatever you get a sock there, there's still if there's a pressure point on your foot yeah. um, that's going to cut circulation, it can lead to cramping. Uh, I mean, we've had guys we've had to work with and try several different brands of pockets. You know, you know where they get pains under the bottom of the feet and it's taken a bit to solve but we um we tend to get through it that's good that's great so it, yeah. it can be if you don't if you don't get a good fitting foot pocket you, you're never going to be comfortable and you can't relax in the water then and with what we do with breath hold spear fishing relaxation is the key you know yeah yeah oh that's great it's it's 
Foot pockets sound a lot like face masks. It's like um, like so many different people don't fit certain face masks. And, and <coughs> I was talking to, we were talking to Trevor Ketchin not so long ago, and I said, what one do you like? And he says, the cheapest, most basic one you can find fits me perfect. If I try any of the expensive stuff, it doesn't fit. And I think the foot pocket sounds exactly. a bit like that. It's um, There's just a lot of variance in people's body shape. Absolutely. Oh, you can run list any of your gear. Like your gear needs to be functional. It needs to fit you well so that it's not in the back of your mind the whole time. A leaky mask it drives me crazy. And yeah. and that's one of the hardest things I've found, you know, to get right. And when you do get a good one, I tend to buy a few of them so they last a while. But um, and, and I know really experienced Spiros are the same. I know one guy, he'll buy 10 of them and keep him going for years, you know, yeah. once he finds ones that fits. Okay, and, and just quickly, um, you also make carbon barrels, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about roller guns as well. Yeah, sure. Go. Our carbon barrel, we started um, a couple of years ago in, in production of Head Out for Sale. It's a, a probably what we'd call a high-end product. It's um, We did the design work, 3D CAD design work myself, um, machined the tooling, and here comes a helicopter again. <laughs> I'm going to stop. Yeah, yeah, it's all good, Larry. Dangerous uh, suburb. Our audience are used to our high-quality interviews. It's all good, mate. So, yeah, no, far away. Again. Mate, it's nearly now. It's going straight over the top now. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like downtown Beirut. Yeah. We, it's a rough neighbourhood here. We can, we can pretend to be war correspondents. That'll do. <laughs> no, Larry, my, uh, my toilet fan sounds pretty similar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not in the toilet. I can promise you that. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we, so yeah, we machined um, we machined metal tooling on our own CNC um, equipment, which we use for cutting out the fins. And um, then the the barrel is made from prepreg carbon fibre, which is a, a a type of fibre which is generally used in the aerospace industry. It, it comes already impregnated with a, a toughened epoxy resin system. Okay. Um, it's stored, it's stored frozen so that it doesn't cure or go off. Um, it has several days out life, so it can be used and taken out of the freezer. It's obviously got to be thawed out before it's processed. Um, and then you have several days to finish the part with it. That's then placed into a mould and it's a uh, two-piece mould closed up and it's, it's cured under about 110 PSI pressure. Mm. And that mould's also heated up to 120 degrees Celsius to then cure the final, the final um, composite structure. Cool. So it sounds like you manufacture most of your stuff r right there in the Gold Coast. Yeah, look, we do everything we can in-house. And, uh, and over the years as we've gone, we've always tried to uh, invest back into the business, uh, into you know, buying the CNC machine so we could we didn't have to outsource any cutting or, or do any hand cutting so it was accurate. And recently we've, we've purchased our own printing equipment for doing our, uh, our camo patterns, and that's given us a lot more scope to do uh, custom designs and oh, some yeah. more, you know, fancy. Stuff. I, I actually Just seen Jason up a bit. I actually seen a city of fins with a with a like a crayfish um, design on them. I thought yeah, they look like, so they look cool. Yeah, yeah, we're actually making a, another couple of sets of those tomorrow for some clients. So they've they've been quite popular. All right, and uh, roller guns. What are the pros and cons according to Larry Gray? <laughs> <laughs> look again, I'm not going to profess to be an expert, but I. I've, We've been playing with them for a while, um, mainly through demand, you know, the, the curiosity in roller guns and, and the demand for it over the past two years, especially last 12 to 18 months, has been phenomenal. Um, I don't think I've sold a conventional gun for 12 months. Wow. Really? Um, no, no, that's right. Everyone's just wants roller guns. And uh, and when you and, and the guns are quite loaded up, so a, a good stiff carbon barrel um, that really suits it. Um, so the advantages, um, you've got a shorter gun. Uh, you know, it's pretty obvious that the gun's easy to manoeuvre um, and you've got the range of a, a gun that's much, much longer. Um, disadvantage, there's certainly some downsides, is that um, you do lose a little bit of um, power, I guess, over the rollers and such, but um, not so much that it's not worthwhile having that configuration. Mm. Uh, the, Difficult to load, uh, certainly a lot harder to load than a conventional gun because you've got a lot more reach. The taller guys don't have any problems. I, I sold a 1200 roller to a guy in WA um, not long ago and he wasn't even interested in a load assist. He could reach it and load it. But for me, you know, I struggle loading 1100. Yeah, okay. Um, we have, we have a, a two-stage loading setup we can run under the gun, which makes it quite easy though. So, If you're uh, struggling with an 1100, I'd imagine turbo would struggle with a 600. <laughs> So, look, turbo rollers. Look, up a lot here. of them are saying, 
A lot of what we're finding or what I'm finding personally is that the common um, thought process with rollers is to, to go with big heavy shafts, thicker shafts to to keep the uh, the uh, momentum in the shaft because it's, it's that much shorter than a conventional gun, um, you know, if you're targeting bigger fish. And if you're shooting a big fish in dirty water, that's certainly relevant. Uh, I'm finding using smaller, thinner shafts down to 7mm shafts and 16mm bands is is working a lot better lately. Okay. Um, again, it's what we find works. It, it's still uh, sometimes can be difficult to educate the, the buyers that that's the way to go, and sometimes they need to just get the gun and try it themselves. And, and we can certainly change configurations quite easily down the track if they want to try something else. All right, cool. Larry. But it's it's really about experimenting, and there's so many variables of the roller gun. You know, rubber length and and preload and shaft size and um there's a lot you can play around with so for guys that are interested in in you really need to be interested in setting up your own gear and putting some time into it and some thought and certainly uh, um keep you busy and and you'll get good results you know they work really well once they're set up cool excellent so are you, you are you using roller guns yourself Just yeah i am yeah. yeah look i still use I, i've got an 1100 roller gun which i use and i've got a 1300 conventional and a 1200 conventional in, in our carbon barrels. Um, they're my main main guns. I'm mainly sticking with the 1100 roll at this stage just to try different things, yeah. but I still love my 1300 twin 16 band conventional gun. You know, yeah. I can I can shoot pretty well if you think with that, and it's accurate. It's got enough range for me. Um, I think range is a bit of an overstated thing. If you've got to keep making a gun to get more and more range, well, you're probably doing something wrong, unless you're up in super clear water shooting, you know big pelagics then yeah. it's a different story cool excellent mate all right larry that was awesome um just a change of pace mate we we like to uh ask this question what was the uh funniest thing you've experienced spearfishing funniest thing oh dude i haven't thought about this one <laughs> i've seen a few funny things um we interviewed a bloke yesterday <laughs> oh, <laughs> hey, his funny story he took a poo in the water and then called us mate over <laughs> just went through it yeah. oh. well, I'm going to gonna tell you a story like that, but I didn't know whether I could go that far. Yeah, no, go I've got a mate of mine. Be free. He's actually, um, he's pretty well known for it. He'll, uh, and I've actually seen a guy come up right under it and it land right across his mask. So, <laughs> uh, <it's been laughs> Unless you're the one with the uh, scar across the, the lens of your mask. <laughs> oh, no. That's Is awesome. he a local guy, Larry? Yeah, like, well, Greg Smith's his name. He's, uh, he's probably the guy that got me interested in making fins, you know. I, I, um, he knew I had a bit of a diving spearfishing background and uh, and then we talked about my composite background one day and he said, oh, we'll have a look at these, you know. And, and at the time, I was only doing a little bit of diving. It wasn't really up to speed what was going on. It was fairly sporadic for me. So, um, yeah, and, you know, he's, he's done a fair bit of diving has been a wealth of knowledge for me certainly got more experience than i have and uh, him along with guys like tony hugh and, and ian puckeridge have, have given me some great feedback with my fins and and when we first started making them those were the guys that we sent prototypes to do the trial and um certainly the first ones ended up in the in the in the pile and we improved from there and it wasn't until those guys gave us the okay that we we put them out there on the market awesome mate we uh it can't be too easy. We, we got a couple of mates, and they, they like to try their hand at anything, right? So they have this brainwave that uh, they're going to make themselves a set of carbon fiber fins. So they've made themselves a table. They've done the whole thing, and um, we're twelve, oh, probably six months down the track, and they've just got one big buy fin sitting there that's never been cut out. So it's uh, it's a bit oh. of work to it. Yeah, they, they had a good. So break. they oh, absolutely. I mean, it's not as easy as just uh, not as easy as a lot of people think, but. No. Yeah, they should have a go if they need to cut it out. Or I, if certainly if they need a bit of hand, if making them for themselves, I'm happy to give them some advice. I, th I think it's probably, like for guys, sometimes they, they look at the cost of some of these higher-end fins and they, they hum and har about it. It's like, well, hang on, our mates had a go at it. 
and yeah. they blew it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they 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 had a tough time. I think they spent probably three four afternoons trying to work on this thing, build the table, mm. get it going, and they still haven't got a set of fins out and, of it. And they're still trying to sell us the table, <laughs> not what we wanted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know. oh, look, I had a guy oh probably a couple of years ago to me now. He, he was in the composites industry, working with aerospace, so he certainly knew how to use the material. And his exact words, well, it's just not worth me setting up for it for the price I can buy it off you. So, and and that's very true. But, um, you know, there's a lot of guys, and spearfishing is um, renowned for it. Um, we've got a lot of innovators in this sport, yeah. and so people need the. We need that. We need to keep progressing, and um, it does keep our development costs down when the guys make their own gear. Like my my father, <laughs> you know, some of the guns I was, I can still remember his old shoulder guns sitting in. The, I don't know if you guys have ever seen photos of them, but the, nah. the big butts. Yeah, and the reels in the butts. You know, I can remember picking those up as a kid, and they just seemed seemed huge. You know, yeah. um, but things like that, and, and certainly power heads back then, that was something they all made themselves and made their own floppers and made their own shafts. And wow. um, that, that's that's a, that's a history of the sport that's that still lives on today. And oh yeah, guys should always have a crack if they can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all too easy now, isn't it? Just to go into the shop and you can just buy the best gear straight off the shelf. Tend to get a bit lazy. Yeah, look, we are sport for choice, and and I think you said earlier that that it's a small sport, and and I certainly had that impression too. But I, I guess compared to some things, it is. But when you look around, I, I've been amazed at, at the growth we've had in our business. You know, every year since we've started, you know, up to thirty percent a year, and wow. it just shows how many people are getting into the sport, and, and how many um, how many more people are coming along. All right, Larry, we do a show with Pedro now. See, it's time for Noob Spiro's Fast Five Facts. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pedro. <laughs> All right, mate, these are five pieces of advice I got um, basically from my old man. Um, safe breathing. You know, I, I can't say any more than that. Don't No hyperventilating. Um, you know, you guys know it all. The free dive training it will teach everyone that if you if you at all um, at a loss as to how to breathe, there's plenty of information out there. Errors beaters video. There's some great things. Safe breathing. Stay safe. Avoid shallow water blackout. Um, as far as your spear, you start small. You know the the fish you're targeting. If you, if you're just getting into it, uh, it's it's a trap. Looking at Facebook these days and seeing all the big fish, there's some fantastic divers out there shooting some fantastic fish. But keep in mind that those guys have been around for a long time. So, you know, stay at your level, work your way up, do it slowly, do it safely. Um, diving with a partner, don't go out there alone. Uh, that one speaks for itself. Um, when you're buying gear, do some research. Again, there's plenty of guys out there you can ask for help. Find the, find the, the uh, gear supplies that will give you all the information and, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Like I say, if, a, if an equipment supplier is – doesn't want to answer your questions or doesn't want to give you the time, well, then you probably should move on, especially if you're new to it, you need that advice. Yeah. And fifth one, last one, it goes along with that. Avoid the hype, the marketing hype that goes with buying gear, especially some of the new composite gear that's out there. Again, do your research. That's good. So I've got Larry Gray's five, oh, five shades of grey that's... <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd go there eventually. Oh, how did you know? <laughs> <laughs> Five yeah, shades of grey. So I got number one was uh, safe breathing. So you referred to an errors um, beaters video. I'm assuming that's on YouTube. We'll have a look at that. We'll try and link yeah. that up. Link you that can access that through USFA uh, and North Shore Underwater Club had it out there too. Cool, <laughs> cool. And number two um, was starting small with fish. Was that right? Yeah, yeah. Don't expect to be going out there and, you know... Um, Plug in a 50-kilo amberjack or something. Yeah, exactly, yep. Be happy to start small, learn how to get close to your fish. Cool, all right. Number three, partner. Dive with a partner. Number yep. four, research the gear you buy. Um, talk talk to people that know and and, uh, and and go to your local shop. Find reliable people that you can ask for good advice about gear. And number five was avoid the hype, which is, which is a great bit, yep. great bit of advice. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Love it. So, five, <laughs> five. Turbo come up with this while you were talking, Larry. I thought it was great. Five Shades of Grey, we're going to call it. That's oh, yeah. The, yeah, no, I'm sorry. a comical genius. <laughs> oh. 
Classic. So I won't, I won't talk about Spectre or Dyneema then, eh? <laughs> you can if you want. Is that our <laughs> bondage? <laughs> <laughs> you might need to know. You might need to know a bit about the book. <laughs> Not that I've read it. No, I got oh. the reference. You probably had to read it, Larry, because you copped a bit of crap with it. I'm guessing. <laughs> so, so um, heard of cr- crucial. You're you're a fiery too, Larry, aren't you? So I would imagine the fiery blokes yeah, give you a bit right. of stick. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, actually, yeah, I had it today. There's, there's two other guys in the job where I work on the case here that both have the same surname. Uh, one I'm sort of related to, his second cousin, and the other I'm not. But um, one of them come in this afternoon, and we got exactly what you just gave us. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was only two shades of grey, though. Oh. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, uh, all right, so look, crucial, at? crucial kit for noobs. So, what piece of equipment is absolutely essential for a, a guy, a guy starting out, and what brands do you recommend, and why? Don't. Uh, oh, I'm going to go. It's not a bit of uh, dive gear. I'm actually going to going to say first aid equipment. Okay. If you're going out in your boat, make sure you got a decent first aid kit and no go and do a first aid course. If you can, an advanced resource course or at least up to senior first aid level. Um, but like you said, I've got a um, background in emergency service, so I know how important that can be. And the last thing we want to do is have an emergency out there in the world and yeah. not know how to deal with it. Yeah, yeah, probably not an exciting one, but it's something that um, we just need to, to keep in the back of our mind and, and make sure we're on top of um, so we look after each other, you know. That's great. Um, Mark Granfield's from down there on the Tweed Club. He organised, in conjunction with AUFQ, some subsidised training turbo, and I did it last year. We did a up-to-date first aid course and radio operators course, and, mate, it was it was friggin', yep. it was crackerjack. Like, yeah. it, was, Good day. it was it was look, awesome. I, I know Mark recently. I know Mark reasonably well, and I've dived with Mark before. And I've got to say, he is probably the one of the, if not the safest guy I've ever dived with. It was so reliable to know that he was going to be up there every time you come back up. Yeah, Fantastic right. guy, and does a lot for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we appreciated him helping him organise the day. So, <clears throat> look, uh, guest call to action. So, this this is our opportunity to um, to talk to our audience about any action you want them to take, Larry. So. Before the show, you said you've got a new page up on Facebook, up and running, Penetrator Fins, so people can jump yeah, on look, and connect with had, you. Yeah, Yeah, sure. We've had a page up and running for a while now, but it was a, we started out with a personal page, so, you know, when we started out a bit small, it's obviously got a bit bigger. Facebook have got onto us and told us we need to go to a business page, so um, what we want, we'd just like, like everyone to get on there and like it and uh, turn on the notifications so that they can see the update facebook's where we put any new products and that'll keep people up to speed with what we're doing it'll also where we showcase our customers uh, uh, catches and and what's going on around the place so so everyone could jump on and just give us a like cool that'd be fantastic you you probably we're also going to be uh just uh, on top of that sorry we're going to be starting to run in some competition this year um so early uh in the next month or two we'll be doing some t-shirt giveaways and things like that and then we'll move on to some fins and and more uh, prizes throughout the year so awesome. make sure they get on there and like it and and keep the notifications on so you can see when those competitions come up do you actually have to shoot a decent fish to be awarded a t-shirt Larry? no not at all oh, no we're going to make yes. it very easy it'll, it'll it'll just we haven't finalized the format of the contest and it won't be anything to do with with what size fish you shoot it'll, it'll be more just more so on you know, likes for your comment or something like that. I was going to say... It'll, it'll be quite simple in our way. Yep. I heard you say, um, you know, your customers share, like, pictures of their catches and that on the page. Like, Levi's got penetrator fins, but unfortunately he doesn't catch anything. Can he just share a photo <laughs> of him with your fins? <laughs> yeah. Larry, you should know, because you liked one of my photos. I had a crayfish up there probably about three or four years ago. It was the only thing I ever got to put up there. It was undersized. He quickly took a photo and put it back. <laughs> yeah, so, Photoshop's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, they're big uh, fins. Fucking hell. And um, we talked earlier in the show, Levi said he read a couple of great articles on your website um a few years ago about about some of the science and um and the physics behind yeah, a pair a of good fins uh, we're going to try and link yeah. some of that content up on our on our website and in your show notes um that's about it i think larry thanks for coming on the show it's been great yeah. to have you and that bit of it those things we post up to try again break through some of the myths 
concepts and the hype that they put out there with compasses and help people understand how they relate and and what, why we use them for the for the fins. Mm. So yeah, we're happy to to uh, to uh, help explain any of that aspect of it. Yeah, no, there's one article in there in particular um, that I found really helpful when I was trying to decide on a set of fins, and it's sort of like yeah, like you said, broke through all the marketing jargon and sort of helped us out. Yep, nothing like a practical demonstration to uh, put things straight. Well, that's true. Hey. Thanks for coming on the show, Larry. You, you, you've delivered us up some gold. Awesome, guys. It's been great chatting with you. Cool. Thanks, Larry. Thanks for listening today, Noob Spiro. If you'd like to find out any more information from today's guest, then head over to noobspiro.com. We really appreciate you guys as listeners. Without you, we couldn't do the show. So if you want to help us out, leave us a review on iTunes or head on over to noobspiro.com and uh, sign up for our newsletter. We won't send you crap. So that's all from us. A big hooroo. We hope to see you soon. Shrek over and out. <laughs>